Well, let's get some questions here on this drive through this week. I've got a question for you. Oh, okay. Did you see Svengooly this past Saturday night? I missed it this week. What was on? Mighty Joe Young. Oh, really? Get out of here. Mighty Joe Young, uh, for the folks who don't know, is was the second wave of giant gorilla movies. First was King Kong and Son of Kong in 1933, and then Kong didn't get any sequels and in 1949 they produced mighty joe young willis o'brien who did the special effects on king kong was involved in this and ray harryhausen this is one of the first big movies that he worked on and he did assisting work to willis o'brien for the <clears throat> the stop motion animation and the photography and everything but you and our friend sven Gulli, of course is on me tv Eight o'clock Eastern time on Saturday nights with the the fine horror movies that he airs. But you know why I'm bringing Mighty Joe Young up. The wrestling connection, I assume. You are correct, sir. Um, Mighty Joe Young wasn't as big as King Kong. He was only about 25 feet tall, probably, according to, you know, the difference between him and and his lovely uh, uh, owner. But uh, he had a tug of war in the movie with 10... Well, let's see, one, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. I thought there was ten. Who'd I leave out? I've only got nine names down. Anyway, nevertheless, I tell a lie. Um, the point is, in they they bring, imagine this, they find Mighty Joe Young in Africa. They bring him to the United States. They make him a nightclub attraction. Drunks cause trouble and chaos ensues, right? it's It's a big monkey movie. So when he's in the nightclub, they're having a tug of war with Mighty Joe Young against uh, 10 of the, uh, as they build him, the strongest men in the world who were all pro wrestlers. And the first time that I saw this movie was on Channel 4, WTTV out of Bloomington, Indiana, the independent station that I saw Dick the Bruiser's TV show on when I first discovered wrestling. And the deal was every Friday and Saturday night, you got to see science fiction theater on Friday nights. And on Saturday nights, you got to see Sammy Terry followed by Bruiser's TV show. And I don't know what their schedule was back then. And I think they were doing some kind of local high school or college Indiana sports on Saturdays because Sammy Terry might be off the air at 1230, might be off the air at 215. You didn't know what the fuck was going to go, right? It was it was floating. But so Bruiser's show would come on late at night, and I always wondered how they were able to get, you know, such big crowds in, in Indianapolis for these shows when the TV was on at 12 or 1 or 2 in the morning. I later found out that they were the real Indianapolis TV airing was Channel 6, a network affiliate, uh, in the daytime on Saturday or Sunday, and this this was a rerun on Channel 4. But anyway, I digress. When Channel 3 went off the air in Louisville, that's when the signal on Channel 4 would come in real good before I got my big antenna. So I saw <clears throat> the last half of some of the most classic horror movies and science fiction movies ever before I ever saw the first part of them, because it would be, it would, you'd either join science fiction theater or Sammy Terry in progress. Right. And mighty Joe young. I actually got to see when I was 10 years old, I just started watching bruisers wrestling show. And when this scene came up, I popped because one of the wrestlers was Sam Miniker. and Sam Miniker at the time was Dick, the bruisers booker and TV announcer. And my God, you, I now know with, with my grown-up eyes, before I was smart to the business, I didn't, but I should have. Sam Miniker was, as I said, not only the announcer, but also the booker. And I know that now, not only because I'm smart to the business, but also because he was the second biggest babyface on the television program next to Bruiser. He was always working an angle with Heenan. He was always fucking, he was a very babyface announcer, and he wasn't going to let the heels get over anything because Sam Miniker was a a big star in wrestling in the 40s and to Sam in the 70s he was still a big star in wrestling <laughs> and so he was it was like Ed Whalen if Ed Whalen had been a wrestler and a strong man that's how little heat you could get on Sam Miniker right but so Miniker was one of the wrestlers that that had the tug of war 
And it was all guys that were working the Los Angeles territory there in the late forties. Cause they were the ones that, you know, got to call from, from, uh, the studios. And also they needed the strongmen type. So, um, it was not only Miniker, Sammy Stein, who was a big baby face uh, of the time killer, Carl Davis, who was a big heel Rasputin, the mad monk, uh, bomber Kulki, who actually was one of the crewmen. Do you remember this on voyage to the bottom of the sea? In the in the mid '60s, I think he was for several seasons. Um, Man Mountain Dean, who was one of the first big guys before Haystacks Calhoun, and but now it, when you look at him, geez, he probably went what like 380, and they're saying this 500 pound Man Mountain Dean. They were exaggerating, but human beings weren't that big back then, so it was, you know, remarkable. Uh, the Swedish Angel, not the French Angel, not Maurice Tillet, but what was the Swedish Angel's name? Oh, was it uh, Olaf? Uh, Phil, uh, Phil, uh, Phil Olafson. The guy, his, what a fucking head, huh? That, do you remember what he looked, his head was literally like two feet tall and only six or eight inches wide. His, his chin for, to his forehead would have covered the upper body of most normal people. <laughs> so, cause he had the uh, pituitary gland issue, but it, it, you know, anyway, they, they were presenting these guys as strong men, but he, everybody else was like uh, Miniker tore a phone booth and half our phone booth. Let me try this again. Miniker tore, tore a phone book in half. Cause he used to do strongman shit. He did that with the fucking Heenan rivalry. He tore a phone book and then Bobby tear six pages and, uh, all the other guys are lifting these weights or snapping these, bending the, I think Man Mountain Dean bent a horseshoe or whatever, because that was a trick that he would do. The Swedish angel had no tricks, right? Because he wasn't really a strong man. He was just a big, ugly fuck. So they had him break an obviously gimmicked two before over his own head. <laughs> and then the, anyway, the last one, oh, and Wee Willie Davis, who became a sheriff's deputy here in Louisville, worked for the uh, sheriff's department back in the 50s and 60s and briefly promoted wrestling here in the late 50s, was the guy who got in the fight with Johnny Valentine in the locker room with the Slapjacks when Bobby Heenan made his first date here in Louisville, and Primo Carnera, who had been the obviously heavyweight boxing champion but was making more money now doing wrestling. He was one of the top gate attractions at the time. And it's a fun segment, but that was so cool. When I was a kid, I got to see those guys and it was like, this is from another era, from another time period, right? Those are so far back in the, in the past. And then I realized that movie was made in 1949. I saw it for the first time in 1972. That's 23 years. So it's the same thing in the pre-video era, things aged quicker. You couldn't just pull up a VHS or go on the internet and find video of stuff. So it seemed like it was longer. That's the same thing now as us, us watching the Montreal screw job 23 years ago. But it seemed like that these guys were from a whole goddamn other historical era. Isn't that weird? Or maybe not. I remember I saw something once. I can't remember where it was or what exactly the figures were, but it was something like, the distance, distance, the period of time between maybe it was Buddy Rogers and Pat O'Connor to Hogan versus Andre compared to like that period of time from Hogan versus Andre to the current day. And it's crazy how much wrestling changed and then how much it stopped changing. Yeah, yeah, you're right, because it has stopped changing. It's all the same shit now, but it's not changing. Yeah, okay, uh, Rogers and O'Connor to Hogan and Andre was 26 years. And then Hogan and Andre, 26 years forward, would be 2013. And doesn't look anything like either of the two things beforehand. At least Hogan and Andre, that era still looked like Rogers and O'Connor, but in color and with tighter ropes and some more high spots. And the different from Hogan and Andre to 2013, the whole goddamn thing just fell apart and changed. 
Part of it, I still say, has to do with people, uh, the ease in which people were allowed into our industry, which didn't start happening until after Hogan and Andre. Once that any, just basically jack off off the street, could do anything in this business, wrestle, referee, manage, promote, book, camera, whatever, the rate of ascension into Shitsville entered warp speed, didn't it? Yeah, I don't know how much of it is people being allowed on the shows versus people just being trained. I mean, once you Well, no, that that's that's what I'm saying. Yeah. Is is th there was if you if you wanted to get trained and you even had money to pay somebody to train you until the 90s, it was still going to be a tough fucking job to find some place. You'd have to move, you'd have to search. Now, that's what I'm saying. The ease in which anybody can do anything in this business, whether they're qualified, trained, know what they're doing or not, has ex every time that accelerates the descent into the overall shit that we mostly see today intensifies. And uh, speaking of, by the way, of dated references, here's something else. Uh, people were on Twitter at me. When we just eviscerated the song and dance two-step that our boys did the other night. Well, way to go, Cornette. You're such a boomer. Like, that is even a... It, it, aren't we tired of that already? Isn't that what every idiot says? Okay, boomer. But you're such a boomer. You're making all these references about the Jackie Gleason show and the Carol Burnett show. Well, that's dated. That was the point, you fucking idiot. Name the last fucking highly rated <laughs> musical comedy variety show on network television in the last 50 years. That's what they were doing. It came straight off the goddamn Carol Burnett or the Jackie Gleason show from 1966. And I'm the one that's making all the dated references. They're out there doing a fucking Rat Pack number like Stephen Eady. Ah... Uh.